do brain work? Let's talk tropes. Welcome back, everyone. It's me, the Garrulous Gecko. Take two of this video because I don't know how sound works, apparently. Today, we're talking about The Monstrous Feminine, which is more uh, feminist film theory than it is like a single trope. It's sort of a collection of tropes. So before I really get into it, I want to introduce a couple of topics. Um, we're going to start with the abject. Back up a second. A quick disclaimer, when I'm talking about the monstrous feminine, I am talking about it in the world of film rather than, sorry, I am talking about it in the world of film rather than the, re rather than the real world. So I am talking about cis women versus cis men rather than the full gender spectrum. Um, and just for brevity's sake, I'm, I'm not going to say that every time. So just keep that in mind as you're watching. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is the abject and I'm going to sit right in my chair because it's squeaking. Okay, we should be good now. So according to Shohini Chaudhuri's article, The Monstrous Feminine, the abject can be understood in three ways. Three ways. Firstly, the abject is bodily waste, such as shit, blood, urine, pus, and dead bodies. It is also the crossing of borders. A border can be moral, physical, or supernatural. It just has to represent burgeoning monstrosity. And finally, the abject is maternal because a baby is both covered in bodily fluids and crossing the border that is mom. However, the maternal body itself is not inherently abject. Rather, it becomes abject through patriarchal ideology. In other words, women are taught to be ashamed, to feel guilty inside their bodies by the patriarchy, but birth allows women to be naked and to be proud of what their bodies can do. Birth may be gross, but it's also beautiful. A good example of the abject as related to the female body and birth can be seen in Kevin Kolsch and Dennis Widmeyer's 2014 film, Starry Eyes. Starry Eyes follows the story of Sarah Walker, who is so desperate to become famous that she sucks an old man's dick, gets inseminated by some devil juices, starts to decompose both physically and morally, and kills all her friends. Through the film, her body becomes more and more disgusting. Her hair and teeth start falling out, her skin is pussy and bloody, and she's so pale she looks dead. Finally, she dies and gets buried by some mysteriously cloaked people, only to crawl her way out in the morning, literally rebirthed as the perfect version of herself. You know, just girly things. <laughs> when we write horror, the monsters we create are often a projection of our deepest fears. So in order to understand female monstrosity, we must first ask ourselves, what are men most afraid of? That's right, vaginas. The most obvious example of this is vagina dentata, translating literally to toothed vagina. You might be familiar with this concept if you've ever seen Teeth, the 2007 horror comedy film directed by Mitchell Lichtenstein. The idea is that the vagina itself is dangerous, that it is a mouth ready to devour, to castrate the man who dares enter it. The fear the vagina evokes is that of a woman's sexual power. Another great example of this is in Neil Gaiman's American Gods. In the first scene, we have this goddess who I don't remember the name of, who is having sex with a man and then just eats him, just eats him right up, just sucks him right up in there. Um, <laughs> I don't know what my point was. I lost it. Read American Gods. <laughs> On the topic of vaginas, I'm sorry I talk about vaginas so much on this channel, but the next aspect of female monstrosity is the archaic mother or as TV Tropes calls it, the mother of a thousand young. Chadhuri describes the archaic mother as the primeval mother of everything, a parthenogenic mother creating all by herself without the need for a father. 
She is the pre-phallic mother, existing prior to knowledge of the phallus. We see this mother figure in films like Alien and Nine, where a mysterious eldritch abomination creates swarms of children. This mother, however, exists outside of morality, says Chowdhury. As the giver of life, she can equally take it away. Just like how Mothership in Alien was willing to risk the lives of the crew for the sake of returning the alien safely. The Archaic Mother exists outside the idea of a phallus because she can create on her own, but the everyday woman is not so lucky. As Shadhuri explains, when female monstrosity is discussed, it is nearly always in terms of the Freudian idea of woman as man's castrated other. However, the existence of the castrated woman begs the existence of her alter ego, the castrating woman, or the femme castratrice. The fear associated with the femme castratrice is of male castration anxiety. To have a better image of the castrated woman versus the castrating woman, uh, let's look at Amelia from The Babadook. She's a single mother trying to take care of her unruly son, in her son's eyes, she is the castrated mother, having lost the male figure in their life. Amelia and Sam are haunted by the Babadook until it finally possesses Amelia, killing the dog and almost taking Sam's life, until together they are able to defeat it. And Amelia, by defeating the male spirit and becoming a more powerful mother, also becomes the femme castratrice. Now that we have a foundation, for understanding the monstrous feminine, let's move on to The Descent. The Descent is a 2005 horror adventure film directed by Neil Marshall. Six women from the UK travel to the Appalachian Mountains to go spelunking a year after the tragic car accident that killed main character Sarah Carter's husband and child. The main conflict is between Juno and Sarah. From the beginning, Juno feels like an outsider, and you see this through the cinematography, how she's always sort of in the background, or she's like behind another character, she's kind of like standing awkwardly, or like looking off in the distance while other people are talking. We get a lot of little things like that, especially in the very first scene, when they when they push her out of like the canoe or kayak, or I don't, I don't know, boats. They push her out, and then Paul like walks into the water and like helps her up, and that's sort of happening in the background, and that's... That's a, that's foreshadowing. Just, just so you know, that's foreshadowing. So Juno feels like an outsider. And at the end of the film, we find out why. Big spoiler alert. Paul was cheating on Sarah with Juno. I know, really interesting plot. Thrilling. Original. Brand I Give him an Emmy. So this film does not pass the Bechdel test. But I'll give it props because it's obvious that Sarah's rage stems from losing her daughter and not so much losing her husband. Our first experience with the abject in this film is when Paul's life comes to a sudden and violent end. Metal pipes that are strapped onto the hood of an oncoming car burst through their windshield and impale Paul right through the face. I feel comfortable arguing that the pipe is meant to be phallic because I once read an academic article arguing that the knitting needle in Halloween was phallic, so shut up. Shut up. My point is that in that moment, Sarah becomes the castrated woman. It's also a metaphor because it's like his, his dick was, was the end of him because um, we're... we're we're led to believe that he's distracted while driving because he's thinking about Juno. So, um, yeah, his adultery was, you know. His so Sarah loses the masculine figure in her life and her motherhood all in one fell swoop. Flash forward a year. It's time to go spelunking. The cave obviously is a metaphor for the vagina. I'm sure you saw it coming. From the slit in the ground to the blood red light on the cave walls, and finally to Sarah being rebirthed by the mountain, it's pretty clear what we're looking at here. But why does that matter? Because it shapes the discourse of the entire film. The women are exploring their own bodies through the cave. They are exploring the gory side of motherhood and the trauma of childbirth. But before the women go down, take a good look 
at the costuming. Juno is wearing a short sleeve red shirt, while Sarah is wearing a long sleeve blue shirt. These short sleeves show Juno's experience and ego. She is confident and bold, but reckless. Sarah is mourning. She's going on this trip to remind herself that happiness is possible, so she's dressed comfortably and conservatively. She is the only one to stay level-headed in the entire film. Except for that one part when she was like, I saw a man. We should ask him for help. The dumbest thing I've ever heard. Anyway. The other women are basically just there to take up space and die. Anyway, because the cave represents the vagina, it becomes the vagina dentata. At first, all is well. But when they find a particularly claustrophobic path, the tunnel caves in behind them and they are now trapped. Surprise! This is when tensions rise and Juno's true character comes to the surface. She tells the other women that the other caves would have been too boring and that she wanted them to discover something. This, I think, is a combination of things. First off, it's Juno's hubris. She is overconfident in herself and blames others for her mistakes, which makes me believe she's also a narcissist. However, this is her way of trying to do something good. She wanted to make it up to Sarah. She was driven by guilt and grief. One of her most important lines of the dialogue in the whole film is, we all lost something in that crash. Referring to the day Paul and Jessica died. She could argue that because Sarah lost a part of herself, her friends also lost Sarah, or maybe they were all friends with Paul, but I don't think that's what Juno means. She's projecting her loss onto the others because she was also in love with Paul. Okay, now the real adventure begins. We get the first abjection from inside the cave. The women come to a cliff where they have to climb across the ceiling to get to the other side. Everyone gets across okay, but Juno goes last and decides they're gonna need their equipment back. So as she's scaling the ceiling, she takes the anchors out from behind her. And this is where we discover the old spelunking equipment still stuck in the ceiling. Meaning someone's been there before and didn't make it out alive. <laughs> the old equipment doesn't hold and Juno falls. Becca, who is holding onto the rope, tries to stop her fall, but the rope tears through her gloves and rips open her hands. Now this may not be the best movie ever made, but it definitely knows how to make you squirm. It honestly could have been just as creepy if there weren't any monsters in it. They hit all the right pressure points to make your skin itch. The cuts on the hands are just the beginning. We also get an ice pick through the neck, bones poking out of skin, a goot a few good crunchy falls, and lots of blood. The thing I like about this film is that it doesn't feel like too much. Anyone would panic if they were trapped in a cave. And I like to see how Juno and Sarah's characters develop as they become more and more calloused. But blood isn't the only abject thing in this film. The crawlers, or the cave monsters, are always drooling. Their skin is moist like the cave walls. They're pale with cloudy eyes, sharp teeth, pointed ears, and flat noses. Very reminiscent of Nosferatu. They seem to be in this sort of limbo, this half-alive state. They have crossed the corporeal body's borders and mutated into something new and inhuman. And their home is full of bones and decomposing bodies of both humans and animals. I love the way they show the den of the crawlers because it's often through the night vision camera. The handheld camera puts us, the audience, in the hands of the characters, watching the world as they see it in a claustrophobic green circle. At first, we're not sure what we're looking at, and then we see a human skull, obvious and terrifying in the green light. If you saw my Crimson Peak review, you already have an idea of what I'm going to say about the green light. It creates the idea of darkness while still letting us be voyeurs. It also creates the sense of alienation, of being in a strange place that you don't understand. The final act of the abject is in the last scene of the film where Sarah seemingly escapes from the cave and drives away. She pulls over to vomit before seeing the ghost of Juno in her car and snapping back to reality where she hadn't left the cave at all. The vomit is both a reaction to the disgusting and horrifying events of the day and also a way to purge herself of her actions and memories. 
But like many other horror movies, the most important abjection is the blood. And the best scene in the whole film, in my opinion, is when we meet the archaic mother and Sarah fights her in the pool of blood. The reason I believe that this specific crawler is the archaic mother is because she's the only one we see with breastitas, basically horror film genitalia, which implies somehow that she has created this whole brood of monsters because there's no other, there's no more tatas. She's the only tatas. She must have made them all. So when Sarah fights her, it's like she's taking back her motherhood. She grabs the antler, a phallic object, and stabs the crawler in the eye. Which, guess what, also makes her the femme castratrice because she has destroyed the thing that was birthing the monsters. No more can be created without the mother. I also really like this scene because the pool of blood can represent different things. In one interpretation, it's menstrual blood, going with the image of the cave as vagina and represents Sarah shedding her weakness to become the femme castradice. But it is also all of the death that is collected in the cave. It's the mingling of years of scavenging and carnage, and in that way, it also represents Sarah's grief. All of this negativity has collected in this pool, and she must fight herself to emerge from grief new and vicious. We can see this when she lays down on the rock after killing the mother and another crawler steps on her head to get to the other side. Here we see this newfound patience and intellect. She has learned from past trauma. She has gotten stronger. As we near the end of the film, Sarah's role as femme castratrice is cemented when she discovers Beth dying in another part of the cave. Juno, in her panic, stabbed Beth in the throat with an ice pick, thinking she was a crawler. Beth, as she fell, grabbed onto Juno's necklace, tore it off, and held it in her hand. The necklace is how we find out about Paul's infidelity with Juno, because it was his necklace and, and Juno had it. When this film begins, Juno is the femme castratrice, having taken Paul away from Sarah, and now, in the end of the movie, when Sarah and Juno come back together, after being separated, the roles have switched. Sarah is covered in blood, her hair is soaked, her shirt is gone, leaving her in a black tank top, and she looks brutal. At first, we think Sarah is there to save the day, but when they hear the crawlers approaching, Sarah turns to Juno and stabs her in the leg, leaving her for dead. This is her final act of retribution. She can never have her family back, but at least she can get revenge on Juno for ruining her life. Fun fact time. The Descent actually had two endings. There was the American release and the original release. In the American version, the film ends after she escapes from the cave and drives away and sees Juno in the car. In the original version, after she see after she sees Juno, she snaps back to reality, back in the cave where she hallucinates her daughter with a birthday cake, implying that it was her birthday, or her, her daughter's birthday. And, you know, this was all on the anniversary of the accident. You know, fun stuff. Anyway, because I'm talking about this film, um, I also want to talk about the issues with the film, not related to the Monstrous Feminine, just in general. First off, there are like six characters only three of them are memorable. The other three just completely blend together. I never can remember their names. The only reason I did is because I wrote them down. None of them have any personality whatsoever. And then when, when they interact with each other, nothing interesting ever happens. Like the first conversation they have together, they're talking about boyfriends and husbands and whatnot. And I'm like, you were literally on this trip because your friend is mourning the death of her husband and you're all gonna sit here and drink and talk about your boyfriends. That's not how people act. This is not how people act. Like, I don't, I don't know what men think women do, but we don't just talk about men all the time. Next, the racism. So Juno is the only non-white character and she's presented as this narcissistic home wrecker. Everyone else is either innocent or a victim except Holly, who is Juno's protege. And also, she is also very reckless and is the first to die, even if it was unintentional. This appears as a statement towards foreigners. It's as if they're saying, 
that Juno, the foreigner, came in and like poisoned the nuclear family, like destroyed the nuclear family. She was like temptation. And then she's poisoning the mind of the youth by making them reckless. Like it's, I don't know if it was intentional and I want to believe it's not, but that's, that's how it comes across. <laughs> also the, the crawlers, the, the cave monsters, it's insinuated that they were American Indians or First Nations people because we see all these cave drawings on the walls, which is usually associated in Eurocentric culture as American Indian. That is literally, like literally calling American Indian savages. I don't know if this is like gross ignorance or just outright hostility, but like that is not okay. Like that is not okay. Besides that racism, it, it's just really obvious that this film was made for the male gaze. I mean, it was it was made for not G A Y S, G A Z E, the gate eyeballs, no boobs, eyeballs. Oh shit! I did a TikTok reference. It's made for the male gaze. It was written by men. It was like produced by men. The only women in it were probably the actresses. Don't take my word on that. I made that up. Um, and like it just, it's a bunch of hot ladies getting covered in blood. Like it's, it's just torture porn a lot of the time. So that's cool. And I mean, it's from 2005 and we've gotten better in the way that we do movies. I don't know what my point was. <laughs> so why is this trope important and, and how can we deconstruct its negative side? I think it's important because when it's done correctly, quote, Creed speculates that the horror genre holds particular appeal for the female spectator, who perhaps feels empowered by identifying with the female castrator." End quote. However, horror is often made for the male gaze, as I've mentioned, meaning it makes these female characters into sex objects. They usually have little personality, or they exist for the sake of torture porn, as I mentioned. So when it's not any of those things, it's usually based on the fear of the female body and motherhood. We fear what we don't understand, and it's only natural that men fear women as they should. My point is, horror will often cross borders that other genres won't, which gives us the opportunity to witness and open conversations about menstruation, motherhood, and the body and how it relates to gender, which gives us the opportunity to understand each other better and to understand different people better, different cultures and different genders and sexualities. And the issue we often run into is that instead of doing that, it's just like, it, it makes a, a speculation out of those things. There's a lot of times where gayness is equated to monstrosity and it's, it's meant to be deprecating. It's meant to be like, being gay is monstrous. You're a pedophile. Blah. And that's because straight people, am I right? So, <laughs> so in The Descent, it's obvious that like, this was a film made by men for men to look at but it was trying to appeal to the female audience. And I think it failed because what the fears they think women have are of losing your husband, infidelity, losing your child, which like, yes, losing, losing the people you love, that's, that's valid. But that's so <laughs> diminishing towards women and people with vaginas, like saying that that's all we're afraid of. That's what we worry about. Like, I am way more afraid of pregnancy and childbirth than I am, oh, my body, I'm so scared of my body. I'm scared of losing my husband. Like, shut up. What I hope from female monstrosity and going forward with this idea, this trope, is that it will be used to empower women and people with uteruses to feel powerful in their bodies, to relate to the femme Castratis. Maybe they're not going around cutting off dicks, but I'm just saying. <laughs> we want to feel powerful. Horror is the first genre and the best genre to give us that opportunity because we can be voyeurs in acts of, of grossness and sometimes violence. And you know, like we don't, I'm not saying we want to be violent in real life. I'm just saying that sometimes you want to be a voyeur to violence. It's like shooting games. Like you don't want to actually shoot and kill people, but like you kind of want that power, like, oh, it's zombie games. 
zombie games because then you're like you're not killing people you're killing zombies but like that power you're like power. so if you want a movie or a show that has female monstrosity that is more empowering i really recommend hush before i wake things heard and seen and if you want a tv show you can try marianne it is in french so if you want to read your movie read your show highly recommend so thank you for watching um i hope you learned something <laughs> that wasn't about vaginas please join me next time i'm gonna be talking about the homoerotic subtext of interview with a vampire <laughs> Um, I regret nothing. This is my life. Buy my book. Delete me. Delete me. I'm...